So the impact of auditory processing typically is going to affect academics in the area of reading and then certainly in classroom instruction and in, in classroom listening. And because instruction in the classroom is still 60 to 70 percent done in the auditory modality, it can affect their ability to follow what's going on in the classroom. And then under the general communication umbrella, um, all of that that we've been talking about, about misinterpreting what's being said as far as the meaning or the actual clarity of it, um, not being able to hear well in, a, in poor acoustic environments with reverberation and background noise um, can be all part of that process. So I mentioned also last week that auditory processing requires a multidisciplinary approach. That if we want to evaluate the ear as an audiologist hearing, we can do that without talking to anybody else. But because we're talking about beyond the ear into the brain, it's critical that we look at other professionals and get input from them um, on some of the comorbid conditions that might be a factor. In addition, we also have to look at why we're doing the evaluation. So as you move forward with some of noting some of the behaviors of a student and you look at tapping into the evaluations of other providers and professionals, and then you decide, yes, I'm gonna screen or do an evaluation, we have to ask ourselves what um, information is this evaluation going to add to that um, student's treatment program, whether it's academic accommodations, actual treatment interventions, um, compensatory strategies that will improve their academics communication um, and progress. So we need to make sure that there's enough evidence from case history, behaviors, other professionals, um, that auditory processing is the direction that we want to go. And again, sometimes the purpose is not to identify an auditory processing deficit, but rule it out particularly when you get into situations where parents want it to be auditory processing instead of attention deficit, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. So when you look at the different professionals that are involved in the process, the audiologist is the one that is going to be able to evaluate auditory processing skills. And the diagnosis of APD needs to come from an audiologist after doing testing in a booth. Now, the reality is there are several test measures out there, particularly ones in speech pathology and education, that have the name of auditory processing on them inaccurately. So, for example, there is a test called the CTOP, um, C-T-O-P-P, -P, and it's the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing. And it is a very commonly used test of phonological awareness, which is a very important pre-language reading skill. One of the subtests or um, sort of quotients that comes out of that is auditory processing. And so if a parent or um, a teacher sees that on the C-top, the auditory processing quotient was low, certainly they're going to then question, do we need further evaluation? The reality is those subtests are actually phonological awareness tasks, not auditory processing. So even though um, there may there are other professionals that may give those tests. They're not inaccurately diagnosing. It's because of the test that they're using. The other one is there's a very popular test. It's called the TAPS-3. It now has a new version, the TAPS-4. But the TAPS-3, which has been around for several years, is actually named the test of auditory processing skills. However, it is a test of auditory perceptual skills, such as auditory memory, um, auditory comprehension, um, auditory reasoning. There are some phonological awareness tests in there. So again, many speech therapists and myself use that test, but in my reports, I have a big bold section that says, despite this test being named the test of auditory processing skills, it is not. Um, and I go on to describe what it does evaluate. And then, um, so audiologists, speech language pathologists, psychologists are going to give psychoeducational assessments in the schools, which looks at um, IQ or cognitive skills, academic skills, may um, do an evaluation for attention deficit or some other um, mood issue or psychological disorder. And again, one of the commonly used subtests of an IQ test in academics is called processing speed. And so often families will say, well, my child did poorly on the processing speed subtest. 
And if you look at that test, what the student has to do, it's a visual processing test, not auditory. So again, we have to be careful when we're interpreting tests that we know what we're looking at, or more particularly, what the student is having to do during that task. Certainly, resource teachers for students that have been diagnosed as learning disabled, reading teachers, the occupational therapist that can look at um, visual perceptual skills and those sensory integration difficulties we mentioned, counselors and social workers if a student is getting ongoing behavioral counseling due to depression, anxiety, attention deficit, we want to get their input. Um, from the parent and teacher, um, my new patient paperwork always includes questionnaires that both of them have to fill out. And we'll talk about some of those um, here in a little bit. So I'm getting input from them. Do they, is there a different situation at school than home? Um, and usually there is because at school we are requiring the student to listen more intently versus at home where we don't have those, those type of listening environments as much. And then in terms of the pediatrician and ENT, we're looking at global medical issues such as ear infections, the medications, any other diagnoses that may affect our ability to evaluate the student or impact their auditory processing skills. So as you move forward with the characteristics and feel that a screening is warranted, there are several ways that a student can be screened for auditory processing. And the um, AAA consensus um, clinical guidelines and ASHA have suggestions for looking at screening. It really does depend on your um, current clinical experience or location or practice. If you're in a school setting, it may look very different. If you are in a clinical aspect, ear, nose, and throat, or private practice, hospital-based, it may be different. Um, so really a lot of it depends on what your parameters are and what works best with your procedure. However, there are several different options when you look at how can I screen. Because I do evaluations, I don't do a formal um, screening by test. My screening is more of a triage in evaluating other evaluations from speech language pathology and psychology, um, talking to parents, getting that behavioral report of what's going on with the student, um, sort of going into detail about the length of the difficulties, what other conditions are present. So more from a parent in interview and evaluation of other um, tests, I am going to do the screening that way to determine whether or not they need to come in. And about 70% of the students, I say yes. 30%, I, after talking to the families and reviewing um, eva other evaluations, I will say this is the direction you need to go instead. Um, because I don't want, I need to make sure that my evaluation is going to add um, important information or recommendations to help that student. And so we want to make sure we are being sensitive to the need for the, the evaluation. So as you look at options, um, there are discussion points here about um, the sensitivity of screening mechanisms and um, also how much time you're spending. I'm going to um, jump to this screen here. So I said that there um, can be case history information, questionnaires that we're going to talk about. Um, specifically made to look at auditory processing. There are some screening tests that have been published that you can use, um, looking at other evaluations, and then certainly what is the student doing? That's one of the things we talk about. So in terms of questionnaires, there are um, a few that are used commonly. The first one is called the Fisher's Auditory Problems Checklist. And this checklist has a list of behaviors that um, usually the parent will say yes to some of the behaviors. I think there's 30 um, sentences on it. And then there's a scoring mechanism on the back. So you take however many um, yeses you put in times whatever, and it tells you, gives you a, a key of yes, there's concerns for auditory processing or not. The other one is the sifter, which I think is almost better because it has a preschool, an elementary, and a secondary version. And this is typically filled out by the teacher. And what I love about the sifter is it has categories. So um, the teacher, there will be a sentence, and then the teacher says, yes, this is a problem or not, on different varying degrees. And they are um, 
grouped by category of academics, communication, class participation, behavior, um, attention. So if I do an evaluation and um, the auditory processing skills are normal and I suspect attention deficit, I can pull out the sifter and say, you know, I noticed um, that the teacher commented most of her concerns for behavior in the classroom are really in this section of attention or class participation or whatever it might be. So there are some other um, ways to then help the family go a different direction. On this other website, this is a um, Ohio-based school corporation that has a training mechanism that um, a module that you can go into and it's, you have to provide your email, but it's free. And when you go into this module, it has every communication disorder um, in speech language pathology, including hearing loss and auditory processing. And under the auditory processing tab, it has a referral checklist which I think is very good. It goes through, um, have I asked all these questions? Have I considered this? Have they been evaluated by a speech language pathologist? Um, is hearing normal? Is IQ average? All of these different um, areas. And then um, if you say yes to certain ones, then certainly it says an evaluation would be warranted. So those are some options. If you want to have families and teachers and other people fill these out and come in, to even a routine hearing test with this information. If the hearing is normal, but the parents are looking at you saying, then what's wrong with my student or my child? These um, questionnaires could be already completed and be there to give you additional information to help them with the next step. Because we do a real disservice to our patients by saying, um, good news, hearing is normal if we don't offer them an additional step, particularly if they're concerned enough about their child's hearing to come in for a hearing test and it's normal then we need to ask some more questions and direct them more appropriately. In terms of actual screening tests that are out there, there are several. Um, the one based mostly in audiology is called the SCAN3 um, and it's called the Screening Test of Auditory Processing. Um, it initially was the SCAN and then the SCAN-C and now it's the SCAN3. The SCAN-3 has subtests for screening and subtests for diagnostic. So in my evaluations, I use the diagnostic subtests often on the SCAN-3 because when I do an evaluation, I have to have at least two tests in every category. And so that allows me to give one of those um, diagnostics as a um, second test. The screening um, tests are used very often um, in my area where audiologists will give the screening tests um, and then refer for further testing. The SCAN-3 does not need to be given in a soundproof booth. It can be given on a computer. Um, it's a CD. It does need headphones, and there is some right-left um, information you need to make sure. It can be given on a portable CD player. Um, as long as there's headphones, the test can be given by anybody, particularly the screening ones and screening subtests. So um, it can be an easy way to um, do a screening, especially as an audiologist. The other one that I find to be even better is the Differential Screening Test of Processing from Lingua Systems. And it was developed by um, Jean Ann Ferry and Gail Richards, a speech pathologist and audiologist, that um, specifically looked at, um, the screening looks at three auditory processing skills, two phonemic awareness um, and an auditory discrim, and then a higher level language. So, um, a, and again, this is a CD that can be given on a computer, on a portable CD player with headphones, can be given, the goal was that it would be given by school-based personnel. So that could be teachers, resource teachers, speech pathologists that um, give this, and it will tell you there are three auditory processing subtests. And if you look at that, three of those skills are ones that we evaluate in an evaluation for APD. So by doing the screening, they can either identify if any of those are weak to warrant further evaluation. But the reality is many students that we suspect have auditory processing won't be able to access an evaluation. Number one, because it has to happen outside of the school system. Um, there are, may not be audiologists in their area that do evaluations. In my state of Indiana, there are three of us that do them. So they may not be able to access those evaluations. And then because it's done privately, 
they may not be able to access it because of finances, if insurance doesn't cover it or they have to pay out of pocket. So I say to school-based personnel, this differential screening test allows you to at least identify um, if there is a weakness in that bottom up, and then the goal would be to provide some intervention, um, whether that's classroom accommodations or recommendations or direct therapy. So it's also $95, which is an amazing price to get screening information on all those skills. And so that's another option. The last one is the auditory skills assessment by Pearson, and that is for um, a three to five year old population. Um, as an option. And then there are two other tests that I don't list here, but one is the Goldman Fristo Woodcock test of auditory discrimination. It's a very old test. It is a picture pointing um, test where they point to minimal pair pictures for pictures that are, have similar sounds um, like male, pale, sale, I can't remember the other one. Um, and they do it in quiet and then noise. And it evaluates auditory discrimination, but it also is a screener down to age four um, to say, are, is the child at risk for auditory processing? The other, the second one is called the Pediatric Speech Intelligibility Test, the PSI. And it has a um, test of words and sentences where the child has a picture of the word or the sentence, what's happening, and they point to it in quiet and noise. Again, not a diagnostic, but it's a way to screen down to age three to say, yes, I suspect auditory processing so that we can provide um, interventions at a younger age because we do know the brain is more plastic the younger the brain. So if we could provide some interventions from three to five, it may speed up their auditory processing skill development where they don't need an evaluation then at age seven. In the speech language pathology world, I mentioned that I often evaluate or look at those tests. And so I mentioned the TAPS um, three, and then there's also a test called the auditory processing abilities test. Any test of phonological awareness or a language test that has no visual. So on one of the very commonly used language tests, it's called the self five. There is a subtest in the receptive language called recalling sentences. And it's literally a sentence memory test, but there's no visual. So if the student does well on the other two subtests that have visual, but they do have more difficulty with auditory only, that's gonna be a red flag for auditory processing. We're also looking for lower receptive language than expressive, so the input of understanding language is going to be less than necessarily the output. So there are, um, when you see a speech and language of L, they typically do receptive and expressive language. So I'm looking for that receptive language to be lower. On your um, psychoeducational tests that are done in the school system by the school psychologist, I'm looking for any auditory memory deficit, and I'm also looking for lower verbal IQ than performance. On IQ measures in school, um, performance IQ tests are typically visual in nature. And then the verbal IQ is gonna be based up of a lot of language and listening. So if their performance IQ is higher, meaning their visual skills are higher, but their verbal skills are lower, that may be due to an input auditory processing problem. Now, when we talk about APD in terms of students, we are assuming we have average intelligence meaning the child's potential or IQ is average. And so one of the um, topics that was in one of the previous um, readings from last week was, when you do auditory processing evals, you will see of the five skills we evaluate, some of them will be normal and others will be abnormal. And you see these patterns of abnormality. So um, it's sort of a profile that you'll see. And so typically there's always one or two skills that are normal and then a few that are deficit. If you see all skills deficit across the board, then that we're suspecting more of a low IQ um, situation where their potential is not there. It's not that there's an auditory processing deficit, it's that their brain potential is not um, there. So that changes our perspective and we need to look for those. Um, some audiologists require that um, IQ testing be done prior to the evaluation. Um, and one of the things I caution audiologists that do auditory processing is if you have a student that has, does poorly on all of the auditory processing skills, 
to caution them if they don't have an IQ measure to consider that before they interpret the testing, because that um, is a sign of something else versus having sort of two skills normal and two skills deficit, which is what you typically see with APD. When you talk about preschool age, I mentioned the two tests that we can do at younger ages. There is a push nationally and with audiologists that do APD testing to look at ways to screen them younger because of the neuroplasticity issue. Knowing that the brain is more plastic at younger ages, the theory is if we can um, identify the deficit earlier in that three to five year old range and provide interventions, then we're minimizing the impact of that disorder or improving auditory function um, that may minimize their academic impact or language impact. So we are um, wanting to identify at an early age. Because I work with our zero to three early intervention program, which is called First Steps in our state, I see a number of two-year-olds that are going into speech and language therapy to do hearing tests. And it's very common that I will have a family that's transitioning out of early intervention at three into the school system, and they will call and say, my speech therapist and I really suspect an auditory processing problem in my preschooler. And what I say to them is if I could put a magic eight ball over their head and say, yes, they are at risk for an auditory processing deficit, what I'm gonna have you do is have them in individual speech and language therapy working on a number of bottom-up processes and skills, watching their language development, watching their emerging phonological awareness. I'm gonna give them a home program um, for preschool age students that includes a lot of interactive learning and sequencing and bottom-up activities. Um, and then I'm going to hopefully not have to see them um, at age seven because if we can improve all of those skills along the way and we know that the brain can improve faster at those ages, then um, we may not need to evaluate them. So the challenge is a lot of our tests that we give um, down to age four or three are picture pointing and all they're doing is identifying functioning quiet and noise. So we don't ever say there's an auditory processing deficit. If those scores are abnormal, we say they're at risk for auditory processing. And so the goal is to try to identify whether it's an electrophysiology test or something that can identify um, students at a younger age because by the time they get to seven, they're typically in first grade and you're gonna already see some academic and communication impact um, from that student. So we're trying to minimize that by talking about the preschool age.